Hi, I'm Carl Azus for CNN 10. Welcome to the show. As we begin a new week of news coverage, the northeastern U.S. has taken one punch from a powerful storm, and it's bracing for another that could strike midway through the week. Americans from Virginia to Massachusetts and every state in between are taking stock of the damage from a nor'easter. On the coast, streets are flooded and homes are underwater. At least six people have been killed. Over the weekend, shingles of roofs were peeled off by winds gusting higher than 90 miles per hour. That's the strength of a Category 1 hurricane. And one resident of Massachusetts says the beach is all over his front yard. But for all the problems it's causing, it's not unusual for a storm like this to strike at a time like this. A nor'easter occurs within the most crowded coastline of the United States, the Northeast, and they can occur any time of year, but are most common between the months of September and April. That's when weather conditions are prime for a nor'easter. You start with a low. It's going to travel from the southeast to the northeast and intensify. Nor'easters are strongest around New England as well as the Canadian Maritime Provinces. Now we have very warm water in the Gulf of Mexico and all around the coast of Florida. It's going to warm the air above it and that warm air is going to clash with very cold air coming in from the north. Now nor'easters carry winds out of the northeast at about 58 miles per hour or more. And keep in mind, the wind direction out of the northeast is what defines a nor'easter. It's also going to cause beach erosion as well as coastal flooding and very, very rough ocean conditions. Now not all nor'easters have snow, but some of the most memorable ones have dumped lots of it. The National Weather Service says the next nor'easter could hit on Wednesday or Thursday. In addition to high winds and waves, heavy snow could also be a part of it. That's especially concerning for the places that were already damaged over the weekend. Last night, power companies said more than 400,000 people had no electricity. And to give you a sense of how unstable the first storm made the atmosphere, have a look at this jet trying to land in a crosswind in Washington, D.C and how much the pilot tried to adjust before he or she decided to postpone the landing. More than 3,000 flights in and out of the Northeast had to be canceled, and the effects of this system were felt as far west as Ohio, which, like New England, saw large amounts of snowfall. Coastal communities in Massachusetts pounded by monster waves. High tides sent water rolling down streets, and into homes. In Quincy, dozens of residents had to be rescued by trucks and scooped up by front loaders. Christine Waycotter was one of those getting a ride out of danger. It's kind of scary because we were the ones standing up on it and having to hold on. <laughs> so, but you know, we're lucky. It's just things that will get lost. Storm conditions are expected to improve on Saturday, but the wind is still a factor. So is coastal flooding. Near Portland, Maine, storm surge left this home teetering on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. The plan is to lift it and move it back a little bit, I believe, but it's a lot of, a lot of things that have to happen before that happens, so we're just trying to keep it from going anywhere. You feel bad for the people, but that comes with having a house on the water. Ocean winds, you lose. Another issue is power outages. In Watertown, Massachusetts, high winds made power lines fall like dominoes. We had traffic lights all over town that were out that were affected by this grid, but the first responding ever saw us, uh, uh, Troubleman, he isolated the area, had him shut the circuit off, because as you can see, the wires were over cars, and uh, it was a pretty dangerous, dangerous situation. One woman in Brocktown, Massachusetts, says her son is lucky to be alive. He was sitting in the backseat of a car when a tree came crashing down. The house shook, and then the tr we, heard, we heard a noise. We didn't know what it was. We ran out. My son was still in the car with the tree on top of it. 10 second trivia. In groups, what kind of animal is known as a raft on water and a waddle on land? Penguin, goose, seal, or turkey? Of these options, the only animal that's a raft on water and a waddle on land is the penguin. So this would be a huge waddle of penguins. Groups of them are also called colonies, and scientists say this is a super colony of more than one and a half million penguins. Specifically, they're Adelie penguins, relatively small penguins that live on Antarctica. 
Though their populations have been decreasing on other parts of the Antarctic Peninsula, satellite images indicated a lot of them were here, and scientists got to the islands in late 2015 to see and count for themselves. Their findings were just published this month. They say the colony was previously undiscovered because the island is so remote that the birds just kind of flew under the radar, get it? And the fact that the penguins are so isolated might have helped their numbers grow. Scientists are hoping the site will be designated as a marine protected area as they continue to study the birds here. Will the work of an American teenager help doctors identify the early stages of pancreatic cancer? The disease is highly dangerous and highly mysterious. The pancreas, a pear-shaped organ located behind the stomach, helps the body digest food and regulate blood sugar. But when it develops cancer, it's hard to identify, hard to treat, and hard to stop. More than 7 out of 10 people with pancreatic cancer die within a year of being diagnosed. That motivated Jack Andreka to search for a better way to identify it. Pancreatic cancer detection is really difficult. All the methods that we're currently using can only detect the cancer when it's in the latest stages, when you have less than a 2% chance of survival. My name is Jack Andreka. I'm 21. I'm a global health researcher at Stanford University in California. And at age 15, I created a new way to detect pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. A close family friend who was like an uncle to me passed away from the disease. It was a really devastating tragedy and it really inspired me to try and find new ways of detecting pancreatic cancer. My breakthrough moment really came in my eighth grade biology class. I was reading this article on all these really impressive properties of these nanomaterials. And at the same time, you're learning about these certain uh, classes of biological molecules. And all of a sudden I was just like, what if I combine these two ideas? I contacted 200 different professors, but I got 199 rejections. It was about like eight months into my lab work. Nothing had been working. But then I did my 10th test of like this test strip. And finally, when I was plotting the results, it worked out into this beautiful curve. It was just one of the happiest moments of my life. It's based off uh, these amazing properties of nanoparticles that only react to one specific molecule, in this case a protein that circulates in your blood when you have these cancers. So what you do when you combine them, you end up with a carbon substance that will only react to that one protein that indicates that you have the cancer. You can actually detect pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer all simultaneously, but also simply switch out one component of it and you can detect an entirely different disease, range from Alzheimer's, other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and heart disease. So, so far, we've run a couple of preliminary experiments with this test strip, and it had over 90% accuracy in the sample size. Things change in clinical trials, but it's going to be a lot more accurate than our existing test, which has around a 60 to 70% accuracy rate. When the test became it's really born, been a life-changing experience. Uh, at age 15, one hard. typically so doesn't get Jack. to skip school to go to the White House. There he is. Jack, stand up, because that's pretty spectacular stuff. It's been a really amazing experience and it's really changed uh, how I live my life. I didn't even know what pancreas was when I started this. So if I could create a new way to detect pancreatic cancer at age 13, just imagine what you can do. In northern Michigan, it's so cold even the ice has turned blue. Here's what that looks like in the Straits of Mackinac, which separate the Great Lakes of Michigan and Huron. A windstorm caused large chunks of ice to pile up, and it appears blue because it's so dense it doesn't have the tiny air bubbles in it that the ice in your freezer has. Without the air bubbles to make it look white, the ice reflects the blue part of light more easily. So it's like the blue light is locked up in prism. As far as we can see, it's only a big deal in the visible spectrum of things, and we're glad we could shed light on something that might have been mysterious. Makes for a colorful conclusion, Roy G, before we go for the day. I'm Carl Azus for CNN 10.